This is the future. You built a time machine? What about the warrior? It's alive, it's alive! It's the sound of science! Ever since Stephen Hawking came out with his black hole theory, physicists, including Hawking himself, have been wrestling with a hole in that theory. That hole is called the information paradox. Well, now comes a theoretical physicist and computational biologist from Michigan State University who believes he has solved the hole in Hawking's black hole theory. Chris Adami, very good to have you on Stateside. Hi, Cindy. It's my pleasure. So for those of us who uh, are more than a little rusty in our physics, give us a refresher on exactly what Stephen Hawking's black hole theory is. So um, black holes, I mean, you know, kids like black holes already, um, and that's probably because they're, they're huge, they're big, and they're sort of awe-inspiring. Um, but before Hawking's discovery in 1975, black holes were really this, black. You know, they were the remnants of stars that had exploded, but they were so massive that the, the, the remainder of the star would sort of fall into itself, basically leaving nothing but mass behind. Um, and so the interesting thing about this black hole was that there was something called a horizon, which is, you know, a few kilometers out of where the center of the star would have been, where if you're inside of this horizon, you could try to, you know, shine a flashlight out and the light would not come out. It would sort of like come back at you as if you, you know, had thrown a ball up that would come back at you, except that the gravitational pull is so high that even light would come back. So in other words, nothing could escape the black hole, and from the outside, it would therefore look completely black. Now, what Hawking discovered in 75 is that this isn't really true because of the fact that what we call the vacuum, which normally would be the absence of everything, Mm -hmm. isn't really just an absence, but in fact, the vacuum is sort of fizzing with particles and antiparticles that are being created in pairs and then immediately have to come back together again and annihilate. And this fizzing that happens everywhere in space, but it happens in particular close to the horizon of a black hole. And if it happens there, then you can imagine that one particle antiparticle pair is being created and one of them falls into the black hole and the other one manages to get out. And now it looks as if the black hole was actually radiating something, as if it was glowing. And that is this radiation effect that Hawking discovered. But that was not the thing that caused the problem. What caused the problem is that as this radiation is being created, somebody has to pay the energy bill for it, and that's the black hole. Ah. So the black hole actually has to shrink in mass for this radiation to come out. And so the idea would be if you just wait long enough, then the black hole would completely disappear. But then, of course, you would say, well, what happened with all the stuff that fell in, the information, the patterns, the songs, the, 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 the different uh, ways in which you can you know, throw stuff into the black hole? So all these patterns from the past, where would they be if everything is gone? And Hawking himself postulated that, well, it means that they're all gone, except that the laws of physics don't really allow for such a disappearance of these patterns that we call information. And so people had thought, you know, since 1975, that we don't understand how the universe works. Because on the one hand, information is not allowed to be lost. And on the other hand, Hawking just showed us that, well, if the black hole disappears, then all is lost. So that was the information paradox? That is the information paradox. And it has uh, preoccupied physicists now for about 40 years since, since that initial discovery. And including you. And you now believe you have solved the information paradox. Yes, well, so the, the reason why I think I have uh, solved it is because I've been thinking about, for, about it for quite a while. So in the, in the mid-90s, I, I worked in an area of physics which is known as uh, the theory of quantum computation. And there we looked at this concept of information from a quantum theoretic point of view. So we knew how to treat the, the quantumness of information. And when I saw you know, the papers about the black hole paradox, I thought to myself, first of all, you know, I don't think this loss of information is possible. And second of all, I thought, let's just calculate you know, how much information is in fact lost lost if if it should be lost Mm -hmm. and the way you do that in the field of quantum computation is you would calculate the capacity of the channel to transmit 
this information. And I happen to know how to do these type of, uh, type of calculations. So together with a grad student at the time, I sat down and I calculated it. And lo and behold, I realized that, in fact, the black hole does not swallow up information. But the only reason I was able to do that is because I discovered that one of the things that is extraordinarily important when dealing with black holes, um, that, however, Stephen Hawking had not given sufficient um, you know, sufficient uh, attention to was the fact that they not just radiate this glow, this of Hawking radiation, they also stimulate the emission of radiation, which means that if I send something into the black hole, the black hole will attempt to make a copy of it. So in other words, I send in one a, letter A, and then at the edge of the black hole, you know, you get two letters A. One of them is falling in, and the other one actually, you know, stays outside. Huh. This this effect of stimulated emission was discovered by, by Albert Einstein in 1917, and he showed that if you would not consider this effect, then you would get lots of paradoxes. And lo and behold, these paradoxes became apparent if you neglected the effect. So it's almost like at the, at the edge of the black hole, there's this huge copy machine that just to make sure that the laws of physics aren't broken, makes copies of the information just before they fall inside. And that is, in fact, how we avoid the problem of the loss of information. And I've actually seen your uh, solution described as an elegant solution. What are you hearing from your peers as, as word of this is getting out? So I've described this theory in the last 10 years to a number of different physicists, and it is true that usually, you know, the first thing that comes to mind is that it is an elegant solution, but it's really because of the fact that, in a sense, it's not my solution, it's Albert Einstein's solution, uh, in a sense. Uh, not that he, you know, uh, would have known how to do this calculation nowadays, but the effect was there all the time. I didn't mm. have to add any new effect to black hole physics. So many of the attempts, and by the way, I'm not the first one who claims to have solved this problem, but most of the attempts that came before me tried to come up with a new physics that would save the universe. However, I didn't have to invent any new physics. I just had to point out that there was an, a piece of it invented or discovered by Albert Einstein, that if you use it judiciously in the context of, you know, the framework of quantum communication theory, that all these paradoxes fall to the wayside. You connected the dots. Well, in a sense, I was at the right place at the right time. Um, so, you know, I, I just made sure that, you know, uh, everybody is aware of the fact that the laws of physics, uh, you know, are not so easily broken. Um, you know, the, the, the way I, I, I really got into this field is the moment I looked at these papers and, and they were telling me that information was, was absolutely lost from my understanding of physics, it, it, it always made me physically sick. I, I just could not look at this and, and say, oh, well, oh, well, no, there had to be a way out. This could not be correct. And it is what drove me for the last 10 years to, to make sure that everybody else understands that, indeed, the laws of physics uh, do not allow such a travesty, but, but in fact, uh, make sure that information is perfectly preserved. I have to wonder, have you heard it all from Stephen Hawking? I have not heard from Stephen Hawking, and, and uh, you know, um, he's not a very communicative person, as you can imagine. Mm. Um, and I have no way of knowing whether, in fact, uh, you know, he's even aware of this theory, even though I think that he, he, he I, I would imagine that he would like this solution simply because what it means is that his theory was correct to begin with. You know, it was not incorrect. It was just missing an ingredient that was, in fact, there. And had he been aware of it, uh, uh, you know, he would have yeah. uh, immediately made use of it. So um, now I have some colleagues that have been going around uh, discussing this theory outside. You know, I had just a colleague who discussed this theory um, uh, in England. And so my suspicion is that, you know, there's going to be an avalanche effect at some point. However, you know, it is not easy to change the thinking of an entire generation of physicists. I realize it's a slow process, and I don't think everybody will immediately, you know, run and stand behind this theory. Uh, however, I'm working on a number of different manuscripts right now that have the same ingredient and show that it solves a number of other problems that are sometimes involved with black holes. So, you know, I, I think it's just a matter of time. Um, but it could take 10 years until, you know, everybody is convinced. Chris, what do you believe your theory means now for really our understanding of what happens in our universe? Well, I think, you know, it is important 
to be confident that the framework that we are using in order to describe all of nature, including, of course, the entire universe, uh, you know, it's not arbitrary. I mean, you know, the, the, it's not like, you know, suddenly things can go wrong, you know, given, given you know, the, the, the type of understanding that we have. We are usually extremely accurate in our ability to make predictions about, you know, the physical world. Um, and it was sort of odd that there was this, uh, this one area that, uh, you know, had a, you know, a, a major paradox uh, of, of conflicting uh, views and, and, and conflicting thoughts um, in theoretical physics. But on the other hand, this is, in fact, the area where our understanding of physics is the weakest, uh, simply because while we have a unified theory for, you know, electromagnetic, electromagnetic um, weak uh, and the strong forces, gravity is not included in that grand unification. So we, we, we don't really have a consistent theory that would completely and fully describe these black holes, which are at the same time quantum objects. Um, so perhaps it's natural that our misunderstandings should be magnified at that intersection. However, what my research has shown that it is not our misunderstanding of the, the grand unified theory that is at the origin of these paradoxes. It was simply then, you know, having overlooked um, an effect that was predicted in 1917 by Einstein. And by the way, which is at the, at the origin of lasers, uh, the S in laser stands for stimulated and the E after it for stimulated emission. So in fact, the, 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 the process that makes lasers possible is in the end the process that also makes the information preservation in black holes possible. This does give us laypersons um, a sense of just how hard and how patient the work is to advance science. So here you're, you're going to something that Einstein realized in 1917, then going ahead to 1975 with Hawking's theory. Here we are at 2014, and you've been able to shed more light on that. And it really is a, 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 a great reminder for those of us who are not scientists of really how much quiet, unseen work has to happen to, to, to move forward. Yeah, and, and, you know, given the fact that theoretical physics is now, you know, quite a venerable history, um, you know, it's difficult to, to be up to date you know, on all of the developments in physics. And in fact, no, nobody can do that. However, what, what every, you know, graduate student in physics should attempt to do is to try to familiarize themselves at least with sort of the basics, you know, the, 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 the relativity and the atomic physics and the elementary particle physics and the condensed matter physics. And uh, nowadays, I think it is often that you can get your, your, your PhD or your doctorate in a very narrow uh, area of physics and uh, without being asked whether you have a well-broadened uh, background. And I think some of the problems that we're running into is that, you know, uh, scientists don't have a broad background in training. I happen to have had such a training that allowed me to, to while I was working on one thing, immediately see the connection to another thing. Um, so, so, for example, you know, my background includes high energy physics, nuclear physics, atomic physics, uh, you know, quantum computation. Uh, so I have a very broad background knowledge, and that allowed me to connect the dots where other physicists perhaps weren't able to connect them simply because, you know, they had not read Einstein's paper. Um, and I happened to have read it, and, you know, th that rang a bell immediately. And I think it's a general lesson in, in, in most sciences. The greatest, you know, steps forward are being made by those people who are aware of similar developments, but perhaps in different fields, uh, which in fact, you know, allows you to also work, you know, in between disciplines rather than just in a narrow uh, wedge of a field of science. Chris Adami is a theoretical physicist and a computational biologist from Michigan State University who believes that he has solved the hole in Stephen Hawking's black hole theory. Chris, it has been really fun to talk to you. Thanks so much. It was my pleasure.